The following pre recorded program is sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. Welcome to About Money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your host, Mike Adams, is a registered investment advisor and works with investment portfolios exceeding over a hundred thousand dollars in net worth, and has a proven track record of managing long-term investments, surpassing the markets in the long term. The information shared in the following program is for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's Mike. This Saturday, we're here on the answer to talk about money. I'm really excited for the program today. We have a very special guest. I started a series on the question, is COVID-19 the Pearl Harbor moment of our lifetime? One of the biggest issues facing us coming out of COVID is in every state, the state finances. Today, I'm very excited. We have Mike Pilichardi, who was elected Washington State Treasurer in 2020. He is the Chief Financial Officer of the state. And he's here to talk about protecting Washington financial health, how those state plans to advance policies that best serve our state's working families and retirees, and the financial transparency that goes along with that. So you want to hear what he has to say, and I feel very fortunate to have Mike share with us. Also today, we're going to have Al Souza, who is one of the top financial advisors here at Adams Financial talk about the economy and what it means for us in managing client assets. But first I want to start with, is COVID the Pearl Harbor moment of our lifetime? Pearl Harbor was the beginning of World War II. And what we saw coming out of World War II and in the years following were dramatic changes in technology. We saw the development of the atomic bomb, which led to nuclear medicine, which led to nuclear power, any number of things. We saw the advent of computers, at that time, very few concepts of a computer. Today, I'm talking to you on a smartphone, which has more computing power than the computers of the 1960s. That came from World War II. The pharmaceutical industry was born in, in World War II. So was radar. We use radar for weather, for geology, even the fobs for our car keys. Those were changes in technology and just some of the changes. We saw changes in lifestyles. We saw the GIs come back and be educated. And that education led to a greater professionalism, which has essentially evolved into a service economy. We saw the home building industry explode. We saw the building of the interstate highway system. We saw airports. We saw changes in media, television, and radio. Dramatic changes in demographics as well. Life expectancy went up. We saw women join the workforce. We saw exodus from the city centers to the suburbs and a migration from the older cities of the Midwest to the West and to the South. We believe here that we're going to see the same kind of dramatic changes in technology and lifestyles and demographics when we come out of COVID. And I want to begin talking about one of the industries, and it's going to take us several programs to get to it all, but expect changes in the energy industry. It's the largest industry. Somewhere between $7 trillion and $10 trillion million, million dollars a year. If you compare that to media, we're talking on the radio. But if you add media, you add TV, you add books, you add movies, you add everything that's involved with media, it's less than $2 trillion, less than, than a third of what energy is. And a lot of what I have to say I took from books called Bold Abundance, and the future is faster than you think. But I want to take you back. I want you to think about this. Somewhere between 125,000 and 80,000 years ago, humans rubbed two sticks together and created fire, according to the archaeologists. So a long time ago, that fire created heat that kept people warm. It gave them a means to cook, and it gave them light at night's time. But as you look at that, what happened 100,000 years ago, more than 100,000 years ago, one out of every three people in the world today lived not much changed from what it was like 100,000 years ago. 
One and a half billion people today have no electricity. That's according to a UN estimate. Half a billion people rely on primitive fuels like wood and charcoal. But what we're going to see coming out of this whole period of COVID is a real change. Those people live with impure water and scarcity of water. They live with major health problems with no medical care. They have a lack of education. But those people are moving and will move from subsistence to consumption. I had a client once who was a plant manager for American Standard in Tianjin, China. This goes back to the the late 80s. And what he said is they employed 100,000 people to build ceramic toilets, ceramic bathtubs, and ceramic shower stalls. At the time they built the plant and started producing those, not a single employee had ever seen a ceramic toilet, a ceramic bathtub, or a ceramic shower stall, let alone use one of those. Today, those people are using smartphones, they're driving cars, they buy their food at the grocery store, they buy their clothes at the department store, they drink lattes, they move from subsistence to consumption and into the middle class. And why is that important? If you look at where we are in this country, 43% of the company sales, of all company sales, 43% of their revenues come from overseas. And if you look at just the standard and course companies, over 50% of their sales, 50% of their income or their revenues is coming from overseas. That's the change that's going on in the world, and that will continue to go on post-COVID. I've been talking about the super cycle that began in 2009, the last beyond 2030. That's a time in which people are moving from subsistence to consumption. The estimates are that 93% of the world's middle class will live in those emerging nations. And the most important factor in all of that is energy. How do we get there? There's a couple ways, but I just want to talk about one of those ways today. Think solar for electricity. Today, solar supplies just 2% of the world's electricity. Just 2%. Not very much, does it? But it's growing at 30% per year. The price per kilowatt of solar energy is less than coal. It's less than oil. But think about doubling every at doubling every three years. Because of 30%, it's doubling every three years. So it goes from 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32 to 64 to 125% of the world's energy. That's in 15 to 18 years from now. You know, that's, that's a rapid growth and that's a rapid change in what goes on in the world today. And where is it going to happen? Transmediterranean Renewable Energy Co-op estimates that one square mile of the deserts in North Africa can produce enough solar energy to, re- to, ch- to be an equivalent of one million barrels of oil or 600,000 tons of coal. Think about it, one square mile. The German Aerospace Center says that the desert in North Africa has enough solar to supply 40 times, 40 times the world energy electrical demand. And we could be there in 15 to 18 years of meeting all of the electrical demand, like computers or pharmaceuticals or radar for two. Solar may be just 2% of the world's electrical production today, but the potential is to be 100%. And it probably won't be 100%. But it's going to be a very significant factor. And it's going to change the world. Energy is the number one factor in abundance and producing abundance. But electrical energy is just 40% of total energy consumption. Electricity is just 40%. Transportation is 29%. 
offices and buildings of 31 percent? But both of those depend upon petroleum. You can see why British Petroleum forecasts that in the next 40 years, what we're seeing today is peak oil consumption and it's going to decline. I'm going to talk about transportation and offices in the next couple of weeks. But let me give you a little preview of what's coming. 13% of all energy is supplied by transportation and cars. 13% of all transportation energy, 44% of all transportation. And it's obvious what we're seeing with the move to electric vehicles. Less automated, less obvious would be automated cars. We're going to see changes in jet fuel and significant work going on to replace petroleum. In offices and heating, we're seeing green buildings, we're seeing solar heat, we're seeing other energies used besides petroleum products. But it also means there are several other technologies that are going to go along with solar heating or solar electrical consumption. We're going to come to a commercial break. I'm going to talk a little bit about those. And then we're going to talk to Mike about what's going on with state finances. We're going to talk to Al about what's happening in the worldwide economy and in the economy in the U.S. So don't go away. We've got a lot more to cover. If you miss any part of this program, you will find a podcast. You can also find it on YouTube. Just dial in and check About Money on YouTube. And we'll be right back after this commercial break. Don't go away. About Money with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on Adams Financial Concepts. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. I've been talking about solar replacing electrical demand or supplying all of our electrical demand. It's possible in 15 to 18 years we can see solar. Solar by itself, without wind, without geothermal, without nuclear, could be to supply all the electrical needs. And there will be nuclear, there will be geothermal, there will be blue energy from hydrogen and other sources. But just talking about solar or wind, they are part-time energy producers because when the sun goes down, solar no longer produces. When the wind goes away, wind no longer produces. So one of the technologies that's being researched now, will continue to be researched, is how do you store that energy when the sun is not shining or the wind not blowing? That's a major issue that will be faced. But think about that in relationship to how do you deliver that energy from where it's produced? I talked about the, the concept that a lot of energy will be produced in Northern Africa, probably in those deserts. They're going to have to transport it to Europe for example, that desert in, in Northern Africa can supply all of Europe its electrical needs. If, if that's the way it goes, how do you transport it? You transport it through a smart grid. And the grid that we use now is very similar to the telecom grid. Before we had the internet, the telephone moved from one spot to another spot and transported voice messages along to the internet and it became a data transmission. And like the internet, the smart grid will be so similar, in my opinion, in our opinion, to what's going on with the internet. You'll have storage at the point of production where the solar panels are. You'll have storage in communities. Communities are going to have community storage of electricity. You're going to have internally in buildings. You're going, if you have a home, you'll have energy storage in your home. And maybe even the appliances will come with a certain amount of energy storage. And when you think about this, and when you think about um, the, the investments that are coming and the opportunities, one I like to think about is the incandescent light bulb. You know, for, for 100 years, we had those incandescent light bulbs. 100 watt bulb would produce 100 watts. The, Technology came along to produce LEDs, and suddenly you didn't need 100, 100 watts to light a room. You needed only four watts. We'll see those kind of innovations continue 
as we move forward in the next decade or two decades. You know, just as the Internet opened dozens and hundreds of investment opportunities, so will solar, so will the smart grid, so will the battery storage. And I haven't mentioned or talked much about nuclear, hydrogen, or even dark energy. We're just tapping the surface on the changes that will be taking place. And many of the companies that will be exploiting this will be opportunities. Many of those don't even exist today. They will exist tomorrow. Richard Foster of Yale did a study in which he said that the companies in the Standard and Poor's in 1920 had an average life of 70 years. They were big. They were safe. They were built to be big and safe. The companies today have an average life of 15 years or less. They're built to be small. They're still, they're built to be nimble. They will be some great opportunities. But before we can get there, we need a healthy government as well, a state government, which brings me to my fellow China. So he was elected Washington State's treasurer in 2020. He is the chief financial officer, and he knows more about the state's finances than most anyone else. And he's put an emphasis on financial transparency and advancing policies that best serve our state's working families. Welcome to the program, Mike. Hey, Mike, it's great to be here. It's always great to reconnect with you. So, Mike, before you were state treasurer, give, let's give us a little background so that people get to understand who Mike the person is, not the state treasurer. Sure. Well, well, you know, look, I mean, lots of things bring people into different roles and different callings at different times. But, you know, a lot of my background, you know, I was born and raised uh, in Indiana. Um, uh, and went to went to college in upstate New York, where I studied business administration and economics. And you know, at, at the time, I, I really had an interest in maybe going into to banking. I, I did some internships related uh, to to banking work. But I had a you know, some major concerns that the way things were working in the banking industry uh, at the time seemed to really be you're much more toward uh, corporate profits than individual investors and the things that help help folks out. And so I ended up spending a year uh, doing graduate work and getting my master's in rural economic development uh, up in Canada on, on a Fulbright scholarship for a year. And then I went to law school at uh, Gonzaga uh, Law School. And, you know, through that, I, through my legal training, certainly – developed an appreciation for how much the, the law impacts everything around us and the way laws are written matter a lot. And so, you know, it's become that much more clear to me uh, through that through that training and then ultimately later through my work as a, as a economic crimes prosecutor, uh, financial fraud prosecutor, and then later two terms in the state legislature, uh, that you know, the laws really needed to be written in a way to, to help working families and retirees a lot more and, and provide a lot more transparency um, in terms of how government works. And so, uh, you know, I've really, you know, since coming into office in, in January, I've, I've really found that, you know, serving a state treasurer really brings a lot of those experiences together uh, in a way to really promote financial transparency and making sure that the, the financial laws are written in a way that really best serves the working families and retirees of our state. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, one of the things that's really important for me is making sure that those laws are written in a way that, that best serve the people and not, and not necessarily corporate interests. Um, it should be written in a way that always serves the people's interests. So let's talk about the Washington state economy. Where are we? When, I remember it was a year ago that people were talking about an $8.8 billion hole because of COVID. Where do we stand now? Yeah. What's, where well, do we we're, go? we're in a much better oh. place. You know, we, we, yeah, we're, we're in a much better place, Mike. You know, when I came into office in January of this year, uh, yeah, we, we were looking at, like you say, I mean, about an $8, $8 billion, a little over $6 billion hole by the end of January in the budget. We were in the middle of an economic recession brought on by COVID. Um, and, and it was a you know, challenging time for many reasons. And our state finances were feeling it just as much. Uh, what I can say now 
is over the last several months, um, you know, our office and, 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 and the legislature and, and others have really been working to, to make sure that we're doing what we need to do here in the state of Washington to protect our state finances. And I'm happy to report, uh, you know, it's taken a lot of work. You know, one of the first things I did as state treasurer is I joined 16 other state treasurers around the country in calling on the passage of the American Rescue Plan, which brought $7 billion uh, to the state of, state of Washington. Um, it shored up uh, a lot of the, uh, certainly the budget hole that we had uh, at the time, it allowed to uh, restarting of our economy. And now we actually are looking at almost $900, uh, $900 million more over projections from just uh, earlier this year. So now we're, we're essentially carrying a budget surplus um, as we as we go forward into the next legislative session. So for all the challenges facing facing the world today, um, you know, folks can feel confident that their state finances are, are in, a, in a good place. It's one of the one of the few, one of the things that folks don't hear hear challenging things about right now is Washington state finances. We're, we we've done what we need to do to, to get things going again. That's awesome. So talk about the refunding because of interest rates where they are. What have you been able to do that way? Well, you know, I remember last time, Mike, that we spoke. It's one of the, uh, this was, you know, o- over a year ago. You know, you mentioned the importance of uh, refinancing our debt, and that certainly has been uh, one of my top priorities since coming into office. So, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, that state government has is we issue bonds, right? Um, you know, the type of things that pay for our, our roads and our highway system, you know, certain school school construction, other capital and a large project, just like people buy a house, they don't pay for it all at once. They, they pay for it over a period of time through the life of, of that item. Um, and so at the same, in the same way that somebody might refinance the mortgage on their house, we're able to refinance our state debt. And it's one of the jobs of my office is to, to manage the debt that's uh, issued by, uh, by the legislature. And so... You know, over this year, we've maintained a AAA bond rating from Moody's, which is the, the highest uh, credit rating you can have from, from Moody's. And with historically low interest rates, uh, it has been a priority of, of, of my office. And we just have a great team who has worked in every way to refinance every available uh, bond that's been previously issued. And over the last year, we've saved uh, the, the people of the state of Washington just in savings a quarter billion dollars by refinancing existing debt. And, you know, that, that's real money. I mean, that's the, that's, that's the difference between uh, certain, certain schools being built or not, certain roads being built, certain fixes and transportation projects. It, it, you know, when I was in the legislature, it always seemed that, you know, we were a million or two, two million short of doing any particular project. Well, when you can bring an extra quarter billion dollars, it's over two hundred and fifty uh, million dollars. I mean, it's actually closer to two hundred and ninety million dollars in savings just this year by refinancing their debt. That's the difference between that money going to Wall Street profits and instead going to the people of the state of Washington. That's my goal. Everything that I'm doing is to make sure that we're getting the money back to the people as much as we can. So I, I feel really good about the, the great work of our, our team in the Treasurer's office. So. It sounds like the health of the state is, is has changed dramatically. It sounds like you're con- you're continuing to work and make the the state even healthier. I think that's that's pretty phenomenal. We're going to come to commercial break. Stay with me, Mike, through the commercial break because I've got a couple other questions to ask. And for the listeners, don't go away because there's a couple key questions that Mike. We'll have some answers for her. I hope he has some answers for her. We're coming back right after this commercial break. Don't go away. Stay with me. We've got more to come. About Money with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on Adams Financial Concepts. About Money with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. I'm here with Mike Pouchetti, the state treasurer, and he's been talking about the state of health of the state of Washington and some of the things they're doing to improve this, the health even over and above what's coming out of COVID. But I have a question, Mike. 
What about the capital gains tax? There's been a lot of talk about the capital gains tax that the state of Washington has passed. What's going to be the impact of that? The gains tax uh, that passed by the legislature last session is going to bring about a half a billion dollars uh, a year uh, due to the state budget. And, you know, that that's a, you know, it's a revenue source from, um, you know, folks who are selling very, very large uh, amounts of, of d- different equities and assets. And, uh, you know, look, it, it's one of, one of the parts of that. And it, there's obviously currently a, cha- a legal challenge to that, uh, the capital gains. Um, and one of the things that was important for me in, in, in talking to the legislature about the importance of passing it this year, opposed to looking at it in future years, was making sure we had sufficient time so that um, we can have this work through the courts and be settled by the courts. Uh, to make sure that the, the courts feel comfortable and ultimately our state Supreme Court uh, is comfortable that, that this is a, a lawful tax. And um, we are confident, at least I, I should say I'm, I'm confident that it, that it will be um, found to, to be, be lawful and constitutional. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we want to make sure that the revenue we're relying on here in the state of Washington is a reliable source of revenue. And so these extra years before it starts getting collected, so the legislature delayed the collection of it for a couple of years. It gives some opportunity for the legislature to fix anything that needs to be fixed before that revenue starts coming in. And so I'm, I'm confident that uh, it's going to be um, not only held to be constitutional by the courts, but if for some reason it wasn't, it won't have any uh, – will have very little significant impact on our credit rating or our expected revenue. Uh, here in the Sounds – Sounds good. I have another question, too, about yeah. it's not just the state that struggled through this. A lot of local governments have. And you set up the local government investment pool. Tell us about that. Sure. Well, one, one of the things that, um, you know, I'm working hard to do in addition to making sure that we uh, rely on the low, we tap into the low interest rate environment uh, to make sure our, our bonds are at the lowest cost uh, possible for the people of the state of Washington. Um, we also make sure that we can uh, help local governments out in making sure they have um, their funds earning the highest interest rate uh, that's possible. And we have what's called, like you mentioned, the local government investment pool um, that uh, allows for us to invest for a lot of municipalities. They will government money by investing money on their behalf. And I, I think it's the type of thing that you know, whenever we can be smart about our state finances and pool resources where we can, it really makes a big difference, uh, especially the more local level you get, because those dollars and cents matter a lot to the folks on the ground. And it you know, reminds me also of a program that we call the local program, which is just the name of the program, but it's another effort where we pool different projects, especially in rural areas in Washington. And projects that otherwise could not uh, be financed. So maybe a local fire truck in Stevenson, Washington, Skamania County, or an ambulance in Oak Harbor, Island County, um, where they might not be able to finance or afford those projects on their own. But what we will do is we will pool all those projects together and issue them at a very much lower rate because of the competitive nature of us as the state of Washington pooling all of those, those projects. And it really makes a big difference is delivering local government projects that otherwise either couldn't be financed or would have to be financed at a much higher rate. And again, these are the, these are the things that where government's actually working for the people in a way that makes sense. And, you know, where I think, you know, I want to do a good job, and one of the things I appreciate about your program, Mike, is, is the idea of financial literacy and getting information out to the people. As state treasurer, it's really important to me that we're doing everything we can so that the people in the state of Washington understand um, what, what their finance is all about, how it's being worked in the way that uh, and make sure that we're advocating for it to work most efficiently for the people of the state of Washington. So let's talk just a little bit about investments through the state. You're doing separately managed accounts. You know, we're very familiar with that, but maybe listeners aren't. Tell us more about the separately managed accounts. Sure. Well, you know, I mentioned the local government investment pool, for example, which is um, an opportunity where we invest uh, on behalf of local governments 
our separately managed accounts program will do for local governments that might have a, have a little bit more money sitting around, you know, where they want to earn a little higher interest rate, um, where they don't have to rely on the same liquidity and rely on the same uh, use of the funds. So it's kind of the difference between an account we set up for a local government investment pool is kind of like a checking account where people can access the money whenever they want, uh, but we try to earn a, a higher interest rate for folks. And then our separately managed accounts more like a CD where people don't necessarily need to be taking the money out quite as regularly and we're able to earn an, a higher interest rate for folks. And uh, that's something that, that has been set up in the last couple of years in our office and we're continuing to expand it this year to even more local governments uh, as a way to, again, get the best return we can uh, for, for every tax dollar that's coming into the state. Well, it sounds, sounds like you're doing an outstanding job. I mean, I can remember a year ago thinking the state was in real trouble with a big hole coming. And yet, from hearing from you, the state's in pretty good financial shape, and it's getting in better financial shape because of your leadership. So, thank you well, for well, what I you're doing. I appreciate that. Well, well thank you. Thank I just want to highlight just what, what a great. Well, I was going to say, I just want to highlight what a great team we have in the treasurer's office who just day in and day out are do, doing, doing the work, and I'm just proud to be a part of their, the good work they're doing here in the state treasurer's office. Well, thanks very much for what you're doing. It's, it's a good job. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. As a resident. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Um, I want to introduce Al Souza. Al Souza is a financial advisor here at Adams Financial Concepts, uh, managing client accounts, and doing a very good job at that. So, Al, Hello. is going to be talking about the economy. I will turn it over to Al. Hello. Let me start out with the story. I had a conversation a month ago with a potential client who had a PhD in biology. He was introduced uh, from another client. He wanted to know about our process. Before I could speak, he started to go into how he thinks we pick our investments. He said that, well, I assume you look at all the data you can find with regards to where the economy is going in markets, and you would make your investment strategy based off of that. I was shaking my head saying, no, that's not what we do. The look on his face was one of puzzlement. He was dazed by what I was saying, like he, like I'd been, like, like I'd been hit by a Mike Tyson uppercut to the chin. You see, I was refuting, refuting everything that he had learned in getting his Ph.D. So I, pa I paraphrased a quote from Peter Lynch. If you're not familiar with him, he ran the Fidelity Magellan Fund from 1977 to 90, where he averaged 29.2% a year. What he said was the first thing he had to do when he started investing was to throw out everything he learned in business school. So this biologist thought we sat with economic charts and data, and that's how we made our picks. I broke it down for him why it does not work and how most of the great money masters never use that approach. However, that approach sounds logical, scientific, heck, it might even sound sexy. Well, let's listen to some recent forecasts that help you show why that method is fraught with pitfalls. In December of 2019, the median forecast for the Wall Street held that the S&P would rise 2.7% in 2020. Since the actual return of the index was 18.4%, that forecast was too low by 16 percentage points. But in April 2020, after the pandemic had taken hold and after the initial action on the part of the Fed, Treasury, and Congress had been announced and initiated, the consensus forecast return was revised down a negative 11 percent, almost 30 percentage points below the eventual outcome. That's from Clueless About Wall Street by Jeff Summers, New York Times, December 2020. At Adams Financial Concepts, we do not use any economist data for our stock. We don't listen to them, we invite them to speak. To us, it's a distraction noise that can interrupt your thought process and be able to find superior investments. Heck, my BA is in economics, and I believe at the time they would give me an understanding of the investments and how markets function. Well, it did not. Lynch, Lynch was right. We're what you call bottom-up investors. We only look at the investments themselves, and we're always fully invested. So the question is, why do we hold economics in high regard with their predictions? Is it because they have PhDs behind the name? Is it because the financial TV shows say 
up next, we're going to get a take on the economy from our chief economist from whichever bank and what this all means for your investments and stay tuned. How would Mark from Oak Tree Capital come to all these shows? And every time they ask him to speak, they try to pigeonhole him into giving predictions, and he won't. He believes, as we do, and as Warren Buffett said, that the macro future is not knowable. Why are they going to predict something I don't know? You might as well ask Mr. Knox about the weather and if the rain in Spain stays mainly on the plane. But Knox goes a step further by saying that economic economists don't market to market, which is a fancy way of saying they don't keep score. They just move on to the next prediction if they're wrong. This is akin to a sports writer who prognosticates about the outcome of games. Whether they are right or wrong, it's irrelevant because there's another game tomorrow. Who cares? I don't care. As long as my Patriots keep winning, I don't really care. Oops, I just lost okay, my three up. Yeah. We're, co we're coming to a commercial break. Hang on. Okay. We're going to pick you right up after the commercial break. Okay. All and right. listeners, stay with us because this is important information to understand. Don't go away. We'll be right back after the commercial break. About Money with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on Adams Financial Concepts. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. Actually, here's Al. Go ahead, Al. <laughs> Thank you. So as I was saying, as Howard Mark said, they don't keep score. Just like a sportscaster, right? They don't care who's it's irrelevant because there's another game tomorrow. Who cares? As I said, as a as a as a longtime Bostonian diehard Patriots fan, uh, as long as my Patriots keep keep winning, I don't care. I think I just lost two out of my three audience because they're all Seahawks fans and having flashbacks of uh, Russell Wilson's interception on the one yard line in the 2015 Super Bowl. All right, I digress here. So, so. Let's go back to 1969. Why is that significant? It changed economics in a profound way. They became rock stars. Think Freakonomics, not Woodstock. 1969 was the first so-called Nobel Prize in economics was given out. It's not a real Nobel Prize. Alfred Nobel spelled out in his will what disciplines will get the prize, and when it was first handed out in 1895. In 1969, the Risk Bank of Sweden decided to give out a prize in the name of Alfred Nobel. According to the Nobel family, they were not thrilled about the prize. However, since it's become an annual prize and announced around the same time as the Nobel Prize, it gets confused with being a real Nobel Prize. The problem with that is it equates economics with the hard science of, say, physics or chemistry. However, nobody disputes what's going to happen when you throw a ball in the air or what you make when you combine two hydrogens and one oxygen molecule. But two economists can look at the same data and arrive at different conclusions. Take this year's winner, David Codd, Joshua Angrist, and Guido Imbens. They won for showing that a, a, rate, a rise in the minimum wage does not lead to fewer jobs. However, in 2014, when Seattle passed their minimum wage, Mark Long and University of Washington published a paper showing that low-income workers would get less hours for their reduced pay by 125 a month. In addition, this paper also said that there would be about 5,000 fewer jobs in Seattle because of the minimum wage hike. Who's right? I don't know. Seattle's hike was much higher than the 80 cents in the card study. Is that going to have a huge impact? I would think so, but I don't know. But that leads us to another topic I can cover on another show, which is behavioral finance. The only thing I'll say about that is when we look at two, the two studies above, we're confronting something called confirmation bias. What we want to believe, we will find or against. To be a good investor, you constantly have to check yourself that you're not finding facts to fit your conclusion. Additionally, we must confront our political bias. If we lead to the right and our strong believers in free markets such as a Milton Friedman or Friedrich Hayek, then we're going to take a face value that a rise in wages will lead to less employment. Employers' highest costs are usually labor. Any rise in costs will result in less employment. Card in a used a natural experiment between two restaurants in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. The rise in minimum wage was 80 cents an hour in New Jersey and it showed no significant difference in employment between the states. This could be considered another school of economics, a Keynesian approach, named after the economist John Maynard Keynes, who wrote a book called The General Theory of Employment and Interest in Money. 
change approach was instead uh, was instead of letting markets figure out what, what the right equilibrium is, is to, is to step in and fix any efficiencies. His book was published in 1936. One of the hallmarks of his theory is that in tough times, it's the responsibility of the government to spend money to increase the money supply and what he called the velocity of money or the money multiplier effect. For every dollar the government spends to create, say, three dollars in the money supply. I know what you're thinking this is going to create inflation like we have now. Keynes would say inflation is short term because in the long run we're all dead, so it doesn't matter. At the start of the COVID in 2002, even the most ardent conservative knew that the government's response was the right thing to do. So back to the minimum wage. An increase in the minimum wage, if it does not reduce employment, can be a dual put more money in, in the pockets of lower paid workers. Since economists know that lower paid workers spend most of what they make, it'll go back and stimulate the economy. That's their theory anyways. Without going into great more detail, you can see how two economists can come up with different conclusions about the same thing. I hope this illustrates the point that economic forecasting does not provide us any sound analysis when we're trying to pick investments. If we go back to the New York Times article by Summers that mentioned that I mentioned, it goes to say that each December since 2000, the median forecast never called for a stock market decline over the course of the following year, and yet the market lost money in six of those years. They even missed the collapse of 2008. That was a significant year. It was also the year my Patriots went undefeated and lost to the New York Giants in the Super Bowl. That one still hurts, but let's get back to what I was saying. The only data from economists that is reliable and no one needs to go the future is that economists have no idea. They're just guesses with long equations that they call econometrics, where one might be slightly more than the other. Following the crash of 2008, Warren Buffett said, beware of geeks with formulas. In 1974, the Nobel Prize, at the Nobel Prize banquet, economist Friedrich Hayek stated that he'd been counseled on the establishment of a Nobel Prize in economics and he would decidedly advise against it, primarily because the Nobel Prize confers on an individual an authority which in economics no man ought to possess. It does not matter in the natural science. Here the influence is exercised individually is chiefly an influence on his fellow experts. And they will soon cut him down to size if he exceeds his confidence. But the influence of the economist that man uses is the influence of the layman, politicians, journalists, civil servants, and the public generally. So I'm sure you're listening to this and settling into holiday plans, hopefully seeing family and friends and are back, but in the back of your mind, you're starting your 2020 plans and resolutions. If your investments fit into that, you're probably watching the pundits on TV to figure out where the economy is going, what's going to happen with inflation and COVID, and how that will affect your investments. Well, good luck with all that. They are there to sell ad time and entertainment, isn't that, what, uh, isn't that what Russell Crowe said in his movie 2000 Oscar to Gladiator? Uh, are you not entertained? Just don't let the entertainment be a substitute for the tedious humdrum task of finding the next best, best stocks. So that the next holiday season, you could be snug in your bed with sugar plums dancing in your head. Happy holidays, everyone. So talk a little bit more about how you apply this to your, your client portfolios. Or do you apply it? Do we apply it to Client portfolios. Do I apply? Are you going to say it again? Yeah. In terms of, of economics, when somebody comes out and says the economy is not going to grow much, how does that affect the stocks that are in our portfolios? Well, it, it doesn't. I mean, we're not we're not going to we're not going to worry about that because we feel like the investments we picked are, are quality in their in their uh, in their going to grow. You know, short term, we might see a hiccup, but as I said, we stay fully invested, so I'm not really worried about the short term. If, unless the client has uh, got a really short-term horizon, then he's not going to be in that position. We're not going to put him in those positions because his time horizon doesn't fit. The, doesn't fit. Perfect. <clears throat> That's a great analysis you've done. And I just want to say, if you're lis- for the listeners that are listening to the program, you should really talk to Al on a one-on-one basis. He's got a wealth of information. He's got a wealth of what he brings to the table. He works with clients very, very well. And 
I think you'd be well served. Give us a call at Adams Financial Concepts and do talk directly to Al. Until next Saturday, when we will be again talking about money, have a good weekend, have a good week, and we're coming to the end of 2021. That's pretty amazing in itself. Have a very good, good weekend. been listening to About Money with Mike Adams, a registered investment advisor. If you'd like more information about what you heard today or about Mike's investment philosophy and strategy, or if you'd like Mike to evaluate your own portfolio, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. That's adamsfinancialconcepts.com. The information shared in the preceding program was for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. Join us again next Saturday at noon for more About Money with Mike Adams here on AM 1590. The answer. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts.